Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Local Health Policy 101, Understanding Ordinances, Resolutions, and Proclamations, brought to you by the Network for Public Health Law, the National Association of Local Boards of Health, and the American Society of Law, Medicine, and Ethics. I'm Charles Strong, the Digital Marketing Coordinator at the Network for Public Health Law's National Office, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during this webinar by using the Q&A tab on the right-hand side of your screen. All you need to do is click on that tab, select all panelists from the Ask drop-down menu, and submit your question. Your moderator for today's webinar is Julie Letterhouse, and Julie is the Director of Education and Training for the National Association of Local Boards of Health. Her work focuses on evaluating practice gaps, identifying priority education, and collaborating with partner organizations to assure resources are available for Board of Health members. Julie will be leading us through the rest of today's webinar. So Julie, over to you. Thank you, Charles. Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar presentation. As Charles shared, my name is Julie Lederhouse and I am pleased to moderate today's presentation. I would like to begin by thanking the network for their partnership with NALVO and the opportunity to co-sponsor this session. I'm looking forward to the presentation, so without further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Jill Krieger. Jill is the director of the Northern Region of the Network for Public Health Law. She specializes in providing legal technical assistance building relationships and fostering connections among public health leaders across the country, and creating practical legal tools and training to assist practitioners, attorneys, and advocates in crafting public health solutions. Jill has a particular interest in promoting the use of food and agricultural laws to better support health at the population level. Before joining the network, Jill served as the Senior Staff Attorney at Farmers Legal Action Group, or FLAG, a national nonprofit law center that provides legal services to family farmers and rural communities. Earlier in her career, in her legal career, Jill served as an assistant attorney general in the Minnesota Attorney General's office. Jill has always been a wonderful resource for NALBO and our local board of health members. She's truly dedicated to connecting public health professionals at every level from across the country to allow for shared learning, resource sharing, and improving local public health. Jill, take it away. Thank you, Julie, and um, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on your time zone, and uh, really thank you for that kind introduction, Julie, and um, I'll go ahead and, and dive right in. Today we're going to talk uh, about Local Health Policy 101, and so to break that down, it's really going to have three parts. Uh, first will be some background information on public health law and policy at the local level. Uh, then we're going to talk uh, for a few minutes about resources, discuss some strategies for researching, researching local health policies. And then finally, I think um, maybe kind of a highlight is going to be discussing some examples of innovative um, legal and policy approaches in a variety of communities, both um, rural, suburban and urban. So let's go ahead and dive in. Okay. So just as, as a, a baseline to make sure we're all on the same page, there's, there's a definition of public health law that's widely used. Um, the study of the legal powers and duties of the state to assure the conditions for people to be healthy and the limitations on the power of the state to constrain the autonomy, privacy, liberty, proprietary or other legally protected interests of individuals for the common good. So public health law involves balancing between the powers and duties of the government and um, the limitations on that power and authority. And we might see that in some of the examples we discussed, but just wanted to start with that as a baseline for our understanding. And that's from a, a, a popular public health law text um, by Lawrence Gostin and, and Lindsay Wiley. One note I wanted to make to begin, um, as I was preparing for this webinar, I, I, I came to a realization that it's really hard to speak on a national webinar about local health policy. I have some fear and trepidation about it 
because it's hard to generalize. We've got, what, something over 2,500 local health departments in the country. Um, and so I'm borrowing an axiom from legal analysis and statutory interpretation that says, um, essentially, if there is general language in a statute, but there is also more specific language, that that specific language um, governs and takes precedence over the general language. And I think that's also going to have to be true for our discussion here. I will make my best effort to speak with great care, with accuracy and precision about the law, and not generalize in ways that are not accurate. Um, but that said, um, I will not be providing legal advice. Nothing on this webinar should be construed as legal advice um, for your specific situation. And if you need legal advice tailored to your specific situation, um, I, I would certainly encourage you to consult with your legal counsel. So where does the authority of local health departments, local health boards um, come from? Well, essentially, we know that public health, the, the U.S. Constitution in the Tenth Amendment says that the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, so to the federal government, nor prohibited by the Constitution to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So the states retain the power to address public health, um, safety, general welfare, and we call that the police power. And by the term police power, we don't mean law enforcement in any narrow sense, but that broad sense of protecting um, public health, public safety, um, and the general welfare. And so that that is, uh, you know, almost an ancient or, or certainly a long-standing power of government. And then that's held by the states, and it's in many states delegated from the state, many but not all states, delegated by the state to local governments. Um, and that delegation may take the form of a constitutional provision or it might be a statutory provision. Um, and a number of states, I think a small minority of states, have what we call home rule power, which um, grants recognizes that as the closest government to the people, that local government units um, should have substantial authority to address um, public health, public safety, and the like, um, though that home rule authority has itself been limited by the courts in some states. But essentially, um, state and local government have that power much more so than the federal government. Um, and so if you want to ask your attorney a question about your authority, you may want to ask a question about the extent of the dele delegation, if there's a delegation at the, to the local level for public health and what the scope of that delegation is, if you're trying to understand um, what the source of your own authority is, whatever your role in the local public health system is. Now, in addition to thinking about the source of your authority, it's also helpful to think about the type of authority that you might have. So for, um, and I'm thinking here particularly of um, policy makers and decision makers, so um, particularly thinking about um, the National Association of Local Boards of Health as our co-sponsor for this webinar. Um, we think of boards of health, um, some typologies have three, three types, some have two types, but essentially, um, you may have governing authority in a board of health, and that's, uh, I believe, a substantial majority of, of boards of health have at least some governing authority to make decisions, to do things like establish ordinances, approve budgets, establish fees, approve permits. Um, in, in some states, uh, boards of health have adjudicatory um, authority, that is the, the authority to make decisions in individual cases. Um, North Carolina, for example, boards of health have, have adjudicatory authority. Um, governing um, authority may also include exercising other legal responsibilities, such as hiring um, and oversight of the health officer. Now, in contrast, if an entity such as a board of health has advisory authority, um, that means that that board can make recommendations, but does not have sort of that command and control power to um, regulate behavior. It's, it's, um, 
it's offering advice and support to the health department or to decision makers at the city, county, or, or other local level, um, perhaps a regional level, um, and, and may have some role in setting long-term priorities, setting the mission and vision of, of the health department. But that, that distinction between a governing authority and an advisory authority is really a threshold decision in terms of when an entity is, is trying to determine, when it sees a public health challenge and wants to address it through public health law or policy, that, that question of, well, what's my authority here, um, both the source of the authority, the scope of the authority, and the type of authority are really important threshold questions to get an answer to. And the best place to get that answer really is um, with local legal counsel um, tailored to the specific um, local board of health or local health department or city council or county board of supervisors or, or whatever the, the relevant entity might be in, in the particular circumstances. Okay. So many people on the call I think will be familiar with the 10 essential public health services model. Um, certainly it's a, this diagram, I borrowed it from the CDC's website. Um, but one of the things that highlights is that um, you say on the outer ring, the arrows, one of the core functions, one of the three core fun functions identified is policy development. So that's why we at the Network for Public Health Law and many of you um, that we partner with in, in your um, associations and in your local health departments, that's why we're so firmly committed to working together to have really robust public health law and policy approaches. So, um, you know, we see developing policies, enforcing laws, mobilizing community partnerships um, are all part of the 10 essential public health services. And how that finds expression then in professional standards for public health, um, I wanted to lift up as well, in case folks may not be familiar with this, from the Public, he Public Health Accreditation Board standards that set forth really the gold standard for what, what health departments um, carrying out those 10 essential public health services, although there are 12 domains to the FAB standards, but um, so it's not a one-for-one -one correlation, but the FAB domain six was the one that I wanted to lift up um, on today's webinar um, as a place where the, the aspirations and the kind of measuring stick for what health, local health departments might do with respect to public health law um, is set forth. So, so the, asp the, the standard is that a local health department should review existing laws and update them as needed. Um, also with respect to public health law, a local health department is, um, should be able to show its efforts and its work to educate the public on the meaning, purpose, and benefit of public health laws. Um, and that education ought to include um, um, information about how to comply with the law, that, that really our goal is not, um, you know, enforcement is part of the package, but the goal really is to assure compliance since we believe that these standards are standards that would um, improve health, so we want people to comply. Uh, that said, conducting and monitoring public health enforcement is a piece of this um, domain six under the FAB standards. And then also working with other government agencies and partners um, to coordinate notification of violations where part of the response or remediation effort um, may, may fall under the domain of, of other government agencies. So then that's just a really, really um, high-level overview of some basic principles to think about when we think about local public health law. And then part of why it's hard to generalize is not simply that there are 20, you know, over 2,500 local health departments, but that there are different entities involved in our public health system. And I'm certainly not going to talk about the literally dozens of entities that may be involved in, in a given local public health system, but, but those most centrally involved when we think about the public health system. 
So the Board of Health rule, when we think about local health policy, um, there's a useful document that NALBO produced um, back in 2012, but it still lays forth some important principles that can guide um, our understanding even today. And the, the six core governance functions of boards of health in general include policy development, resource, resource stewardship, legal authority, partner engagement, continuous improvement, and oversight. And so even amidst the variation of the, the design of local health departments and the nature of those, their authority, those six governance functions remain pretty consistent across the board in, in terms of policy development. Um, boards of health tend to lead and contribute to the development of policies that protect, promote, and improve public health. Whether they carry that out um, through a governing capacity or an advisory capacity, um, you know, may vary from Board of Health to Board of Health, but every Board of Health has a role in um, leading and contributing to the development of policy. Similarly, um, a Board of Health must exercise its legal authority as applicable by law. Now, that legal authority may vary, um, but it, members of a Board of Health have a responsi responsibility to understand um, what the nature of their own specific role, responsibility, obligation, and function of their governing body is. Um, and that should be provided. Um, many boards of health will have um, provide training for new board members, provide manuals that will guide, will provide guidance, and then legal counsel um, is typically also a resource. So that, that, um, that's, what we can say in general about the Board of Health role, certainly a Board of Health is a key player in policy development, um, but it, their precise role may indeed vary. The city and county government, whether that's um, you know, a county governing body such as a Board of Supervisors or a city council or um, a city executive such as a mayor, um, any of these may have a regulatory or policy-making role depending on the structure of the local health department. And frequently, um, the, the budget will be um, developed or at least approved by um, a, a, an entity separate from the health department or the Board of Health. Um, so that's, those are important roles um, to, they're important players in the dis development of local public health laws. The role of the health department then, uh, I think, can sometimes um, be, be challenging to, to understand for, uh, particularly when one is new to the field, but the role of the health department is frequently in offering expertise and recommendations to the policy-making body, whatever entity that may be. And it's a really critical role. Um, certainly, we want to see evidence-based policies, and it is the health department, the health officer, and their staff who are in the best position to have the best command. Um, they have the training and expertise to um, access and interpret the evidence to do community health needs assessments. Um, to work with stakeholders in the community to develop recommendations regarding community health improvement plans, for example, um, and then policies that may, be, may help support execution of those community health improvement plans. So that expertise role, um, that role of providing recommendations, um, understanding that the final decision typically does not rest with the health department, but that um, you know, what the health department says, the health officer says, their information and recommendations are, are typically taken quite seriously by the Board of Health. Sometimes there's a robust discussion, but that's, that's the nature of, of the role. Um, the health department also has a role in implementing and enforcing the laws, and that, um, that can take a variety of forms. Okay, the role of legal counsel is uh, 
pretty pretty straightforward and yet I think sometimes a source of confusion. Legal counsel provide legal advice and it may vary who their client is. So it's important to understand that in terms of to whom the um, legal counsel owes a duty of, of care and zealous advocacy and loyalty, um, whom they're actually representing in a particular circumstance. Uh, legal counsel may draft or may draft proposed laws in the first instance, or they may review laws that are proposed by health department staff. They, and their, the review should be with the goal of ensuring compliance with local, state, and federal law. Many legal, legal counsel also provide advice regarding confidentiality, privacy, and data sharing. Most legal counsel will see their role as explaining and identifying uh, legal risks. Um, most legal counsel would extend that further and say legal risk management, and that can sometimes be um, a, a place where the different parties have to navigate um, some different perspectives and priorities, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Legal counsel can also um, assist with enforcing laws, um, defending laws if they may be challenged, um, if they face a legal challenge um, as to the authority of the uh, policy-making body to enact that, that law. Um, legal counsel may also review and draft contracts. The experts really do advise that every public health agency in the country should have adequate access to dedicated governmental legal counsel with public health expertise. And when we see the list of duties and the role of legal counsel, you can see why. Um, certainly we do hear from local health departments that, that struggle um, with obtaining that adequate access. And it may be that there is access, but um, it's cost pro prohibitive is, is one frequent barrier that we hear. But one of our goals at the network is to assist local health departments um, in developing innovative strategies to ensure that adequate access and to support local council and provide them with the, with the tools they need to provide um, advice tailored to a particular situation of a particular local health department. And I just I wanted to hold up this resource. It's it's on the network's website if if the type is too small for folks to be able to read. Um, if you just search pump handle, I think it'll turn up. But I think it's it was created by uh, a former colleague, Andy Baker White. He's now on on staff at ASTO. But it really helpfully outlines the roles of legal counsel why there may be differences of opinion with, with public health staff and how to navigate some of those differences. And, and really, if I would, were to boil down the message of this poster, it's that an attorney may have a goal of legal risk management um, and the public health, you know, the health officer or the public health official may have a goal or the local government official may have a goal of achieving a public health purpose. And so what's really important is just really good communication, clear communication about goals. Um, there may be a higher risk tolerance um, on the part of the public health official or the local government official um, than, than the attorney had been aware of, or the importance of the public health goal may be more May, may be greater. So just really sharing, but, but that said, the risk may be greater than the public health official had, had understood until that dialogue takes place and there's really a, a frank and constructive exchange of, of um, goals and, and a discussion about strategies. And, and frequently it's helpful for a local health official to, to, to state at the outset when seeking um, legal advice from, from legal counsel, what the public health goal is, to be really clear about that at the outset, I think is, is often very good advice. But I do commend this, this resource on the network website. It's, um, I think it's quite helpful. And another um, way that we've boiled down kind of a framework for all of the players to work together in terms of advancing public health law and policy is something we call the five essential public health law services. And there's a citation to a, a brief article in Public Health Reports that was published uh, late in 2016 
um, by, by some of our public health law colleagues, but really looking at successful campaigns, public health law campaigns, things like um, tobacco control, the tobacco control movement or the movement to um, adopt um, requirements for seat belt um, installation by manufacturers and really looked um, that it was not just attorneys. The, the, the responsibility for public health law was really an interdisciplinary collaborative process that took the access to evidence and expertise of public health professionals that did require the expertise of attorneys and policy professionals in designing legal solutions, um, that took a collaborative effort to think about framing messages and garnering community support and engagement. Um, and then the once a law is enacted, the support for enforcing and defending those legal solutions. Um, and evaluation of, well, did it work? How could we make it better? How can we compare laws in different jurisdictions to determine which are the most effective? And um, really engaging in an iterative process. But, but this framework, I think, helps lay out how those different roles of the different players in a local public health system can come together to create um, you know, a whole that's greater than the sum of its parts. So did want to share that model and commend that article for, for further discussion. So in this webinar, there are, there are a wealth of tools that we can use at the local level to advance public health. But I'm going to be focusing on, on examples, um, uh, three types of examples. And those are ordinances, resolutions, and proclamations. Now certainly, you know, it's not an exhaustive list. I certainly know, for example, in the emergency preparedness context, something like a mutual aid agreement is a critical tool. Um, as as um, particularly smaller health departments are looking at strategies to stretch resources, um, shared service agreements, memorandums of understanding and memorandums of agreement are really critical tools. But for purposes of this webinar, I did want to um, focus somewhat um, on, on these three, three um, tools of local public health law. So an ordinance is essentially what we think of when we think of law, I think, at the local level. It's an authoritative rule or law, and the goal is to require or prohibit certain behavior um, through, and, and it's generally an enforceable law. Now a resolution, in contrast, is a formal expression of an opinion or an intention. Um, it may be an expression of a broad commitment, um, or perhaps the goal is to increase awareness and inspire um, other stakeholders to act. A proclamation is similar to a resolution in many ways, but it's a public or official announcement or a declaration addressing an important matter. And the purpose really is educational, increasing understanding, raising awareness, um, potentially um, galvanizing the community. And um, at the outset of the webinar, I had cited uh, Gostin and Wiley's book on, on public health law. One of the other useful things in, in the first chapter of that book, um, which is available online, um, one of the useful things they do is list tools of public health law. And, and it's really illuminating. I think there are maybe six or seven things on the list, but only one of them is direct regulation. So another uh, tool of public health law is, for example, changing the information environment. So we think, think of things like labeling requirements and the like. So, um, and, and there are other tools as well. But, but the purpose here is to say ordinances are not, you know, the only tool in the toolbox. Particularly for, for advisory boards, the ordinances aren't, aren't available. Okay. So that concludes kind of the, the nuts and bolts background on public health law at the local level that I wanted to address. Um, oh, and, the, and this is, um, I think, a useful tool. It's, it's from a, a broader document called Drafting Effective Policies from the Public Health Law Center and just sets forth some elements of an effective policy. I also cite um, on, the, on the right side, a couple of other useful resources for actual assistance with drafting. Um, sometimes where dollars are scarce, for example, at the local health department level, <clears throat> uh, 
attorneys who, uh, excuse me, local health departments or boards of health who have access to legal counsel try and do, you know, get things teed up as far as they can for, for the attorney's review. Um, and that's a, a way, a cost-saving measure. And here are some tools that can help um, help staff or policy staff to, to help tee things up for, for the legal counsel. So I did want to share that. Okay. So that concludes the overall overview of, of local public health law. Um, next, we'll just do a quick, quick review um, discussion of some resources and strategies for researching local public health law. And I, I hope you'll indulge me. I have a, a preschool child at home, and he's uh, currently obsessed with, with Goldilocks and the Three Bears. And, and this is his favorite illustration from one of the versions we have. Um, and it cautions against taking shortcuts through the forest when you don't know what dangers might be lurking. And I, I want to give some strategies and some resources for doing research of local public health law, but I do also want to caution all of you that this isn't a one-size-fits-all kind of strategy. It's not simply a matter of, oh, here's another jurisdiction that has a local food procurement strategy. Let's let's. Um, essentially cut and paste it, and, and, and that can be our policy. Um, there is nuance in terms of those, those matters we've already discussed, the source of your authority, the scope of your authority, the nature of your authority, that you need to review carefully to make sure that it's consistent um, and appropriate also culturally and um, economically and environmentally appropriate in your community. So caution is advised. I, 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 the other image I consider using was um, uh, Ronald Reagan's statement um, in terms of um, international affairs. He always, one of his sayings was trust but verify. And I think that's not a bad slogan in terms of researching and looking at, at models as well, uh, public health law models from other jurisdictions. Because certainly it's incredibly helpful um, to, to have models from other jurisdictions. Now, a few years ago, I might have said that researching law, public health law at the local level was more art than science. That's starting to change. We're starting to develop more rigorous methodology um, that I'll touch on briefly to bring to bear even on local public health law research. But it may be a matter of timing. If you have a city council, if you're a local health officer or a local health department staffer and receive a question from a city council or a board of health member, um, you may not have a lot of time for, for a really robust, rigorous, thorough, comprehensive research. You may have three hours, you may have three weeks, in which you only have three hours for the actual research. So here are some strategies. Um, uh, this is an overview. So um, public health law concepts, here are some resources to learn more about public health law concepts like preemption, like pro, uh, home rule, uh, like some of the other topics I discussed. Um, public health law organizations often have, these are some of the public health law organizations that we work with most closely at the network. There are certainly many others, but they often have resources addressing particular topics or public health law questions or challenges, so they're a good place to start. Um, public health organizations, m many of the major national organizations, APHA, ASTO, and NACHO, and NALBO, have public health law working groups. and. For example, I know this summer at the annual conference, NHO will have a public health law, policy, law and policy um, track at the conference. So there may be opportunities from your public health associations to hear recommendations. Um, Healthy People 2020 has a law and policy component. Uh, the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps, um, What Works um, has both some of the scientific evidence and, and frequently has information about law and policy approaches to address public health challenges and strategies to improve health at the community level. Municipal law resources, um, I may, this is um, part of, we're getting into some of the new and developing methodologies for local research. Um, city health was one I did want to highlight, it's an emerging um, project uh, with support from the De Beaumont Foundation, um, but really looking at our 40 largest cities in the country, and they've identified nine core strategies 
that really can move the needle as far as morbidity and mortality. And those nine strategies are paid sick leave, high quality universal pre-kindergarten, affordable housing and inclusionary zoning, complete streets, alcohol sales control, tobacco 21, clean indoor air, food safety and restaurant inspection ratings, and healthy food procurement. Um, and the website is just cityhealth.org. Um, so I, I can talk more about that perhaps in the Q&A if, if folks are interested to learn more about that. But it is a, an approach. It, again, it's focused really on our largest urban communities, and part of our goal with this webinar is to look at, at medium and smaller health departments as well. But um, it is a very in-depth analysis, and it's an attempt to bring some of the strategies of policy surveillance and legal epidemiology to to bear on local public health law, that strategies that have been really effective and um, have made a big contribution at the state level, beginning to turn that lens to the local level um, for critical strategies in terms of healthy eating, tobacco control, um, early early childhood education, um, affordable housing. So some of those, those strategies that many, many, many communities nationally are working on. So city health may be a good place to look um, particularly for, for communities that if you're not in the top 40 largest, you might be, you know, just uh, the, the next size down it might be a good, good resource. Um, topical law resources. Many of these resources are, are sort of, you're just doing a quick Google search. You're using, um, you know, the internet can be your friend as long as you proceed with caution and you use that trust but verify slogan. I did highlight a couple of resources there at the bottom that do tend to highlight laws and policies and programmatic approaches of particular relevance in smaller and rural communities, the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, the Rural Health Information Hub, the National Rural Health Association. So those can, can also be a great resource. Um, certainly, if, you're, if you are faced with a research question and you're asked a question about, hey, where can we find this information, or what are other communities doing, I would encourage you, you can also always contact the, the network with those types of requests for, for legal technical assistance. Um, and I will just, um, I think I'll, I'll say for Q&A if, if people are interested in learning more about some of the methodolo methodology behind approaches like City Health or um, another project called the Healthy Food Policy Project, I can share some of that as well. But I do want to highlight, um, before I turn things over to Julie in, in a few minutes, some specific examples of innovations that we're seeing in small and medium-sized communities. And I will say that the genesis for this webinar actually began with a specific request for legal technical assistance from a policy analyst at a local health department who said that she had a rural board of health interest in passing a resolution in support of, of health in their community and, and ask, what are some samples from, from more rural communities of, of public health resolutions? And, and so I've linked, we've got a report of that specific TA request up on the website, so I provided that link. But here are some of the examples, um, both when I was responding to that specific request for technical assistance as well as um, research that I've continued since that request. Um, Change Lab Solutions has developed a model resolution for a community, um, particularly a Board of Health or other policy-making body that wants to announce its intention to support health in all policies. And this can be the dialogue to um, involved in proposing such a resolution and discussing um, with other government agencies, other local leaders. Uh, that can be a really important dialogue to begin the conversation um, for more specific strategies and open the door for strategies to address uh, the social determinants of health down the road. Um, there's a specific example from, from Caswell County, North Carolina as well that I cite. But the, the notion of health and policy is simply that, that we consider health impacts even in the context of housing policy, transportation policy, um, education policy, um, and, and just 
stating that one intends to do that, intends to take that into account when policymaking at the local level, um, can be a really powerful thing to do. Uh, the National Association of Counties has been, um, had a campaign um, recently um, to address, uh, to combat rural child poverty. They've been working um, also with the community coaches at the um, County Health Rankings and Roadmaps program, um, and really, really promising two-generation approaches. Every community is taking a slightly different approach among kind of a menu of strategies, but one example of, of a county that has adopted this rural impact county challenge resolution is Ure County, um, Colorado. Um, there's just a wealth of examples in, in the areas of healthy eating and active living such that I couldn't begin to fit them all on one slide. Um, one place to look um, as a clearinghouse was recently released, the Healthy Food Policy Project, which is a collaboration of a number of entities, but um, they have both a, a database of specific policies as well as some case studies of of communities, many of which tend to be larger communities, but still, um, I think, provide meaningful examples and insights. Um, an example from my home state, Egan, Minnesota, a suburban community, is a healthy eating and active living community resolution. Again, that, that kind of announcement of an intention to support specific policies in, within a constellation related to healthy eating and active living. Food policy councils can be an excellent strategy to address issues across the food system, and, and I provide a link to a sam sample resolution. And that's an opportunity for stakeholders across a local community, from, from agriculture, from food service, to groceries, to community-based organizations, you name it, to get together and, and discuss ways to improve the food system in that local community so it bakes in that stakeholder input. Um, complete Streets Initiative, uh, Smart Growth America has been um, assessing and analyzing initiatives. They, they slightly changed their methodology and, and their approach um, this past year, but a really great resource for an overview of what's going on in the field and so that you can, in your local community, consider what your purpose and your priorities are and, and look at a variety of models. Um, food procurement policies are an interesting one. We've, there's a wealth of strategies and analysis and examples of approaches, um, both the city health model that I discussed earlier and the Healthy Food Policy Project um, discuss procurement policies. And, but there are also emerging resources that look, take a broader lens than, than simply a nutrition focus. Um, there's a, a growth of, of strategies looking at financial impacts, looking at um, climate impacts, and so I wanted to recommend some of those um, resources as well, each of which chooses examples from a variety of communities around the nation. Um, Tobacco 21, there are, there are resources um, related to Tobacco 21 that have been adopted in um, smaller and medium-sized communities, a really um, demonstrated strategy um, with an impact on still the leading co preventable cause of death in the United States. Environmental health, solar, solar uh, resolutions. Uh, now, interestingly, we, we typically think of ordinances, you know, planning, zoning, and permitting strategies, but I've, I've recently been learning um, about um, solar group buys as a strategy where the, the local health department or the local government convenes um, but partners with nonprofit organizations um, to facilitate really the operation of the private market but lower costs for participants. Um, really powerful and interesting model there that does not require a regulatory, uh, a hardcore uh, regulatory approach. Uh, mental health, a few strategies that I wanted to lift up. Um, uh, proclamation related to mental health awareness and mental health first aid, again, raising uh, awareness within the community. Walla Walla, Washington has been working for a number of years to address on um, strategies to address, 
uh, address adverse childhood experiences and to promote um, trauma-informed approaches, particularly in the local schools. And they have a, a, a proclamation of a Resilience Awareness Month. Um, a number of national entities are working, um, have worked to promote a resolution to reduce the number of people with mental illness in jails, and some of those parties include the, the Council on State Governments as well as other partners. So I see that uh, we did want to save some time for um, Q&A, so I'll just a uh, couple, couple remaining slides. Um, one of the interesting things from the 2016 NACHO survey and profile of local health departments was uh, I was shocked by, by a diagram I saw or this chart showing that the topic areas of new or revised ordinances in the past two years was um, the, the low percentages. But then I compared that to a chart that said involvement in policy areas in the past two years by size of population served. So again, this approach that broadens our lens when we think of local public health law and policy beyond ordinances to other policy approaches, including resolutions and proclamations, but other policies as well, um, we can see uh, a much more active and robust role for local health departments and much more activity than we see if we home in really narrowly just on ordinances. So in short, to return to Goldilocks and the Three Bears, there's a lot to, to consider. There are a lot of good resources. I encourage you to work with legal counsel um, and with resources such as the Network for Public Health Law and um, other public health law leaders, the CDC's public health law program and Change Lab Solutions, Public Health Law Center, Public Health Law Research. There's a wealth of resources to help you get to that policy solution that is just right for your community. And I'll hand things over. Uh, here's some contact information for me, and I'll hand things over to Julie for question and answer. Great. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, that was a great overview. So we do have some time for questions. Um, please do um, use the directions on the screen to enter your questions. Um, I had a few early ones that came in to Jill, so I'll skip schedule with Jill as folks have some time to think about additional. Um, as you mentioned, this presentation was kind of born out of a request for technical assistance and systematic ways to find actual policies from small and medium-sized health departments is definitely a gap in the literature. Um, do you have any plans for further collection and analysis? Well, um, <laughs> that's uh, I could I could turn that question back on, Ju on you, Julie. I know we've talked about um, NALBO working with its members to begin to collect some of those sample resolutions, proclamations, and, and ordinances. Um, you know, and and I think f for my own part, I can't I can't speak specifically for the the network as a whole, but for my own part, I I am working with with colleagues here in our northern region as as well as partners outside of the network to collect examples of of local level approaches to um, promote mental health, um, trauma informed care, um, and approaches, for example, social and emotional learning in the schools. Um, I did want to, you know, I'll take this opportunity just to say a bit more. Um, as I said, you know, I would have initially said that this was a matter more of art than science, but with the growth of the City Health Project and the Healthy Food Policy Project, there really is a burgeoning um, development of methodology for, you know, a thinking through of how can we do this in a systematic way. And I would encourage people to visit the websites for the Healthy Food Policy Project. Um, as well as for city health, and they do set forth um, the methodological choices that they make. Now, interestingly, um, the Healthy Food Policy Project does really focus on more ordinances, resolutions, and codified laws, um, but less so um, on policies that are aspirational or advisory. Um, so I was interested by that. Um, but so I think for stay tuned and also for folks who are interested in this kind of work, stay tuned and also, uh, you know, check out City Health and the Healthy Food Policy Project. Thank you. And again, I think as you shared, 
Yalbo is interested in working with the network to help collect that as well. So as we work with our members, um, certainly look forward to kind of continuing to grow those types of resources. Um, looking at other questions that are coming in here, um, what are some of the challenges and pitfalls you often see from theoretical drafting of these kinds of um, tools to the operational implementation? Oh, gosh. Hmm. Well, I, I think, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's kind of that one-size-fits-all approach that can be problematic. So um, is, is it a policy or legal approach that's designed for a health department with a certain level of resources or a certain level of staffing that is not going to translate very well to a smaller or even a medium-sized health department? Um, does it count on a certain amount of population density that isn't always the case in, in many local health departments? Um, and, and that said, the, the other thing, the other pitfall I think is, is there a plan for enforcement or is all of the energy focused on passage of the law or the policy, the ordinance or the resolution? Um, and is that same energy dedicated to implementation and enforcement? Um, and in, in terms of securing passage of the law, you know, it's that middle step of that essential five, the five essential public health law services. We talk about building community engagement and, and harnessing political will. So in terms of the strategy for passage of a law, is it one that brings the community together um, and is successful in forging some kind of uh, consensus, some kind of buy-in from many of the key stakeholders, um, such that there really is a social norm change, for example, around, you know, things, we think of things like indoor um, smoking, clean indoor air acts and, and smoking laws. Part of why they succeed is, you know, good drafting in the law, but partly also the community engagement and the change in social norms. So I think that's why having all of the parties involved and not just the lawyers involved can really um, prevent that kind of pitfall where you pass a law but the community actually um, doesn't support it. Okay. Um, we have a couple questions that are related here. You shared the, the IOM statement stating that every public health agency should have adequate access to dedicated governmental legal counsel with a public health expertise. As you mentioned, that certainly can be a challenge. Um, can you share any like innovative relationships or agreements you've seen to locally retain this kind of expertise? And um, do you know where the I mean, where do the majority of local health departments obtain that kind of legal counsel? Do they seek that out privately, or do they look specifically to you know their local corporation counsel? Yeah, great question. Well, and, and, and one that the, the network is spending some energy around and, and we're in conversation with um, public health associations um, across the country. I think this, we've got a, a, an issue brief that we're working on internally. I think the strategy often is um, someone who's an employee at, of perhaps the county or the state um, that person may be dedicated to representing the Board of Health and the Health Department, or that person may have a number of duties across uh, local government, and that can impact the time they have to dedicate to developing public health expertise. Um, when you're contracting with private attorneys, I think most uh, county governments or boards of health or, or local health departments seek out um, you know, at least attorneys or law firms with an expertise or a specialization in municipal law. Um, the innovative strategy that, that is kind of a twinkle in our eye at the network at this point isn't really uh, actualized on the ground is the shared services model. So if we're able to share services such that, you know, a sanitarian or an environmental health specialist or a maternal and child health specialist or an emergency preparedness coordinator is able to serve um, through memorandums of understanding, for example, is able to serve a variety, you know, several local health departments. Could we work 
is there an and an, an, could we by analogy say well let's have shared services for legal services such that um, there would be an incentive for an attorney and maybe it's a an attorney at a firm that specializes in municipal law but would there would that create enough demand, enough work for that attorney to really build expertise in public health law? So stay tuned for that. That's kind of in, in our early stages of development. We're working with um, at least one public uh, state public health association on that. But um, if, if folks are interested in that, I'd, I'd be happy to have more conversation after the webinar as well. There are certainly challenges involved in that in that strategy, but. Certainly challenges that have been overcome in other contexts for sharing services. Okay. Um, we've seen a grouping of questions as well that have come in. Um, can you describe any other innovative policy approaches related to environmental health? Um, and some questions that are specifically coming in related to that, um, like things such as banning the use of styrofoam in restaurants or setting a social norm to request water in restaurants instead of it being freely offered especially during a drought season in some of those states that um, struggle specifically with that? Um, well, broadly speaking, certainly there, there are examples from environmental health. I, I chose to highlight the, the solar energy examples um, as one people might be less familiar with, but certainly there are other examples we could, we could turn to. The CDC um, has worked for a number of years to develop, for example, a model aquatic health code to address, um, to set forth model provisions to regulate pools and water parks which is a great resource for state and local governments with, with that um, authority. Um, I know in, in many states can find animal feeding operations continue to be a threat. Um, I've, I've seen a model resolution from um, a group called Sustain, the Sustain Rural Wisconsin Network. And it's an interesting approach because it's a resolution um, in support of a statewide moratorium on construction or expansion. So I think that's a helpful example to think sometimes what a local level resolution or proclamation is doing is really aimed at that local community. But sometimes if local communities uh, work together in a statewide approach, but you've got local communities across the state adopting a resolution, that can send a message to the state legislature as well. Now, the specific examples that you had questions about um, changing norms um, around whether water is automatically provided in restaurants or would have to be requested, that's not something that I've researched personally or I'm aware of others who have researched, or I'm not aware of resources, but it is something that I could follow up with. Um, you know, the person who raised the question afterward or, or perhaps address, I don't know off the top of my head of resources addressing that or if there are legal and policy approaches to that, but perhaps there are that I'm un unaware of. Um, there was also the question about styrofoam in restaurants uh, and I'm afraid my, my answer there is similar. I have done some work looking at approaches to plastic bag bans mm -hmm. and um, and that, um, we've got some network re resources, resources up on our network website, but um, styrofoam would be one that, that I'd, I'd have to do some research on. Great. Um, there's a couple more here before we conclude. This is pretty specific, but just given um, the high amount of kind of press and what we're, you know, the, the, crisis, the public health crisis we're facing, do you have any knowledge of local policy that has been passed in communities related to Narcan? Um, and the use of that? Um, yeah, I, I, uh, uh, we do have a, a I, I'm inclined to defer to a colleague here at the network who, who is really um, kind of our in-house expert on, on Narcan and Naloxone. I mean, certainly there are approaches, there's a lot of discussion lately about medication assisted treatment um, apart from naloxone, which is more for, for interrupting um, and reversing overdoses. Um, I, I'm afraid I, at the tip of my tongue, I don't really, that may be one I could follow up with the requester or perhaps connect with, with my colleague who's, who's kind of our in-house Narcan and naloxone expert, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. 
Well, but I'm not afraid. I mean, that would he will provide excellent assistance and better assistance than I can provide off the top of my head. Oh, that's so helpful. I think this shows what a great resource network is as a whole. Um, finally, this is kind of more kind of your overall picture. Somebody asked the question, health departments historically have been perceived to just be entities for giving vaccinations, birth control, et cetera. I do suggest we move forward to change the perception of not only public health in general, but decision makers that, you know, that health departments are policy, involved in policy and, and have a place there. Um, well, I think that's an excellent question and, and I can't really do it justice, but my brief answer um, is several fold. One, I would really commend taking a look at that site, the, the 2016, the NACHO um, local health department profile. There's just a wealth of information in there. And one of the really compelling um, graphs, I think it was from chapter 11, the policy chapter, demonstrates the rise in policies that address social determinants of health. I mean, it's just these arrows that are heading on a pretty sharp trajectory upward. Um, policies that address health, you know, education and health, transportation and health, um, you know, housing and health, and that intersection, or health and all policies approaches as well. And, and of course, that chart is from a 2016 profile, and I would suggest that that trajectory is only um, heightened since 2016, since that research was conducted. So certainly looking at the actual data um, of what health departments are doing and, and, you know, things like the Culture of Health Prize from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that are highlighting kind of community-wide efforts, but often where a health, the health department plays a core role as an anchor institution or as a convener. Um, I think those stories can be re really compelling if you can tell the story of, say, a, a Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri was a recent Culture of Health Prize winner. Um, telling those stories, you know, it's kind of that public health 3.0 model or the, the public health, the local health officer is the chief health strategist for the community. Certainly any of those models provide messaging that can be helpful and, and certainly I would also be remiss if I didn't lift up some of the work um, public health law colleagues like Jean Matthews here within the network and Scott Burris at Public Health Law Research and Colleen Healy Bufides in, at the network as well um, around this concept of crafting richer messages for public health. And we actually had a three-part webinar series um, last fall that's archived on the website. So I'd certainly commend that um, discussion for that as another um, approach for, for that messaging to talk about the broader role, you know, that we're not just doing, it's important work, the vaccinations and, and the like, but that it's, public health is much broader than that. Great, thank you. I think that's all the time we have. I'll let Charles go ahead and um, take us out, but thank you, Joe, very much. Thanks, Julie. Yeah. And thank you everyone for your participation in today's webinar. And thank you again, Jill and Julie. Um, I learned a lot and I know our attendees did as well. Just a few notes to all of our attendees. You will be receiving an email that will have a video playback of this webinar when it's available, as well as a link to our brief survey. Uh, we value your thoughts about today's webinar and what topics you would be interested in future webinars, so please take a minute to fill that out. You'll also be receiving an email from ASLME with information on applying for CL, CLE credits for this webinar. And finally, if you enjoyed this webinar, please check out some events that today's co-sponsors will be hosting this year. The 2018 Public Health Law Conference will be hosted by the network and ASLME in Arizona this October, and now both 2018 conference will be hosted in North Carolina this August. So make sure you register for those events. Um, there'll be ones to remember. So that concludes today's webinar. Thank you all for attending and have a great rest of your day.